Hi everybody, I'm uh, Will Armstrong. I'm on the Spotlight team here at Unity. And before this, I was the lead programmer uh, at Campo Santo on Firewatch. I'm gonna go through a lot of what we learned from Firewatch and a lot of what I've learned working with uh, Armature uh, on ReCore here uh, as a, on the Spotlight team at Unity. The Mechanum is a very, very powerful tool uh, used for animation, but I see it get kind of misused a lot, uh, misunderstood a lot. Mechanum, at the end of the day, is a visual scripting language. It's a visual scripting tool. It's a visual scripting tool that's built specifically for making animations, but that doesn't make it not script. And as you're building your Mechanums for uh, your animator controllers for any given character, uh, you need to treat it like you would treat a script. You need to build for clarity, you need to build for reuse, you need to build to extend, support, and debug your entire mechanism setup the whole way through development. It's very easy for an animation tree to grow unbounded and become a sort of web of states that's very difficult to work with. Um, if you take time out of your schedule and kind of trim it back as it goes, you can get your tree to grow in a sustainable way, in a way that you can build on as your game becomes more and more complex and as your characters become more and more expressive. So I'm gonna start with uh, an overview of the character Henry on Firewatch. Um, no? Still no. Uh, anyway, let's skip the video, it doesn't seem to wanna to load. Uh, if you're not familiar with Firewatch, it's a first-person game with full body awareness. Uh, you play Henry, a sort of out of shape, middle-aged uh, forest ranger out in the woods of Wyoming. Um, there's a lot of very expressive uh, player animation in the game, despite only being hands and a body. And because it's first person with full body awareness, it kind of mixes a lot of the problems of both a first person character controller and a third person character controller. Uh, you need it to be very expressive, but you also uh, need it to be very responsive, and you can't really cheat a ton. You can look down at any time and see your legs, you see your hands touch things. The state machine that I'm gonna show you, all of the data that I'm about to show you is all from the animation controller that we shipped Firewatch with. This is Henry as he shipped out. So there's gonna be a lot of really good lessons on what to do and a lot of stuff that I'm gonna use as an example of what not to do. Um, I'm gonna go over very high level and then kind of dig into a couple of really good examples afterwards. So I'm going to be going quick for the next 10 minutes or so. Kind of apologize in, a, in advance. The things you should be looking out for is places that we were able to encapsulate com complexity. Uh, Henry was a char complicated character and dealing with all of that complexity at once in one layer or one state graph was completely unworkable. So we had to pull everything in as much as possible, get things hidden in substates, get complexity only where it needed to exist and not everywhere. Uh, the other thing to look for is patterns. Uh, we used very, very similar patterns in the state machines over and over again. It lets you familiarize yourself and kind of get your bearings no matter what substate you're in, no matter what layer you're in. Uh, we're gonna start out with this is the list of every parameter that we shipped with in Firewatch. Uh, it's a lot, but it could be a lot, lot worse. Uh, you'll see a few things in there like um, item type. Item type could be, I think we had over 40 different kinds of unique items that you would hold in your hands. Um, use type, same thing. We had a lot of different variations on them. It very quickly became obvious that having a different param bool parameter for every single item used, every single pickup, which is sort of the naive implementations how we started, was not going to work over time. Um, it's very, very handy to pack those kind of similar bools into one int that you can then say, if I'm gonna pick up a mug, that's item type zero. If I'm gonna pick up a book, that's item type one. Uh, and I'll show you how to organize that so that the fact that it's just numbers ends up being an aid, not a detriment. Uh, this is our first layer. Basic locomotion, everything builds off of this, so you wanna keep it as simple as possible. 
when you're thinking about layers, think of them as like uh, kind of a rough analogy to a class in script. You want everything in a layer to serve a similar purpose because every layer controls both what other layers it overrides, whether or not it affects certain bones, whether or not that layer is said to be additive or uh, standard overriding animation. It can get very complicated uh, very quickly if your layers don't serve sort of a holistic purpose. Again, think of it like script, think of it like a class. You want everything in a layer to share both the same behavioral and the same logical uh, function. Uh, so I said that the base locomotion state was simple. It's not. It's hiding all of its complexity. This is our locomotion blend tree. It's scrolling off both the top and the bottom of this screen. It's, there's a lot here. Um, this, however, was built over the you know, two-year de development of Firewatch, and it never really gave us any problems. Blend trees don't have state. They don't call back out into code. All they do is blend between all of these different clips based on you know, whatever parameters you pass it. That means that you can iterate on it without worrying about breaking the rest of your game. This is a perfect place to hide complexity. The second you start seeing a tree that has lots of different clips that are transitioning back and forth between them, interrupting all of those transitions, what you probably want is a blend tree. A blend tree is going to hide that web of states but in a much, much simpler way and prevent you from causing bugs down the road. Because you can't tie behavior to most of these animations, you won't, and you'll end up with a much more stable uh, setup for iterating on as you move forward. Uh, also, you'll notice that a lot of these clips are actually the same clip duplicated multiple times in a blend tree. Uh, the reason for that is it gives you really tight control over the final look of your game. If, for example, if you're going from like a jog to a walk to a run, you may want that jog to walk transition to happen at like 10 or 20 percent of your total speed. Hang out in the walk for until you're at 80 or 90 percent of your total speed and then finally move into your faster run. Um, by putting the same clip in twice, you can then just control those uh, blend tree weight knobs to be at those percentages. And you'll just crossfade the clip between itself and then the final result will look consistent across the board. Uh, so an example of going back into your mechanic trees and trimming, trimming them as you go is this layer. It doesn't do anything in the final game. It was a feature we added and then cut and forgot to actually remove the clip from. Um, this is a pattern you're going to see over and over again in this tree. This is kind of the hub and spoke. Most layers have this pattern. This pattern is really, really powerful. What this, what this layer does is it just hangs out and does nothing most of the time. Uh, this layer is responsible for all of the actions in the right arm. Mostly that is being driven by the lower level states like locomotion, but when you're doing something specific, it bounces out of that empty state, goes and does whatever sort of conceptual job it needs to do, interact with an item, interact with the world, uh, pull out your compass, and then goes back into that empty state. When you're looking at this tree for the first time, it's, you, know, you can see those transitions just come out, come back in, come out, come back in. And it's easy to sort of spot where the problem might be as you're debugging. This is the other pattern I've used very, very heavily throughout this state machine. Shared entry, shared exit. This got added relatively, uh, so Firewatch started development in Unity 4.6. So these mechanism features were coming in as we progressed. I think this came in in 5 or 5.2. Um, using the entry and exit states in a sub-state machine is guaranteeing to whatever uh, other team members might be using this animation system that your you don't care about the sort of higher level state structure. You don't care what the tree that is above this looks like. You will handle any variations that need to, ha need to be handled on the entry. You will handle any variations that need to be handled internally. And then you will exit gracefully. Uh, use this pattern over and over again to have a, an encapsulated piece of state. All right, I'm going to start going through these layers real fast now because they're just the same. This is the left hand. Uh, it's hub and spoke. Uh, bringing down into the map, very similar. You've got uh, idle to empty, map locomotion. Nothing very complicated here going on. 
You'll note though that this is kind of a web, everything kind of cycles around. This probably should have been a blend tree. This definitely should have been a blend tree. Look at, I mean, this is just exactly the kind of web structure I was talking about. Uh, this is raising and lowering a map and idling. We should have just driven that parameter around. Uh, if you want to get the behavior of having a nice, slow, graceful transition from something like a raise to an idle to a lower, you can do that by just controlling the rate at which your game code alters your parameter. You don't have to use a transition if a transition isn't the best fit. Uh, because like I said, everything can interrupt everything else. This was a source of quite a bit of bugs. And this is what happens if you don't do any of the things I've been talking about. If you just let animation run wild. Uh, this is all of the different performances on the radio hand. Raising it up, bringing it to your face, gesturing with it. It's a nightmare. Fortunately, almost none of this affects game code. This is all purely visual. Because it was purely visual, it was allowed to run a little rampant, and I never went back and fixed it up. It was also always working. Since it wasn't causing bugs, we didn't fix it. It's not worth making something elegant if you're gonna just to fix bugs later if it means you're injecting bugs now. Um, this is just a bunch of additive anims, hub and spoke. Uh, you can see the beginning of the uh, item type pattern. All of these transitions key off of item type, and all of these transitions are ordered for, in an ascending order. So that first transition happens when item type is zero, the next one when item type is one, the next one is item type is two. Uh, that lets us collapse what could be a really ugly number of variations into a single integer, and then you can track down exactly where in the list that is. It requires a lot of discipline to keep that working, but it's completely worth it. Um, I have no idea what this layer does. I actually found it when I was making this presentation. I never saw it before the couple of weeks ago, and I couldn't be happier about that. It's the hub and spoke model. It uses all of the same uh, parameters that we had already established. It uses the same patterns that we had already established. And our animator was able to add an entirely new layer completely by himself to make new gameplay systems hap uh, work correctly without a programmer. That's the dream of Mechanum. That's why you have a visual scripting system, so that people other than programmers can make complicated systems. This was upper body blend, used both hands, hub and spoke, nothing complicated. Generic use, also nothing complicated. Hub and spoke, just as simple as the last layer. Okay, I lied, this is actually what's inside that substate machine. It goes on for a while here. We, we have a lot of different items that you can use in Firewatch and all of them ended up with separate animations. Um, while this looks like a nightmare, Again, we were very, very rigorous in making sure that every state in here had a shared entry, a shared exit, had and uh, flowed freely through there. No interruptions, no cycles, no way that it could get stuck in the substate. So once it went in, it was going to play some sort of use animation and then come back out. The specific animation didn't really matter for the logic. This is also strictly ordered from item type zero all the way to you know, item type 46 or however many we have up there. Uh, spine blend, this is uh, relatively late in the tree because anytime that you're setting up an additive layer, it's gonna affect every layer below it. This is why you kinda need to think about your layers ahead of time. Uh, having a layer this deep in the tree lets you have uh, a consistency of motion across a bunch of different states. Uh, in this case, it's just a spine blend, so it's kind of like doing the sort of resting breathing motion. You want that to move across all of your uh, locomotion relevant states. Otherwise, you're gonna see hitching every time you change between one layer and another. If you put this sort of spine blend animation into all of the clips with holding an item or picking up an item or moving around, you're going to get the player jerking at, when they pick up an object. It's a really good use for additive layers and uh, like I said, why you need to kind of think about the structure of your layers ahead of time. So now we're off of locomotion. Uh, we no longer need that spine blend. There's another hub and spoke. This is for all the full body animations, moving around the environment, repelling down walls, spawning in in the first place. This is all of those navigation moves. We called them cool guy moves because you were using through the world like a cool guy. We once again packed a whole lot of variation into one substate. 
we have a really consistent pattern, the entry exit again, and we once again sorted by move type. So every, uh, we put edges in the world and you could just put an int on them that said, what kind of move should I do when I get here? And these moves are in order of those ints, zero to however many we had, 20. This is the lockbox. This is not how you should set up a tree. This is again another example of just letting it kind of grow organically over time. It's also one of the first things we set up we got it working once, and we're really, really hesitant to break it. This is an example of what you kind of don't want to do with visual scripting. All of these states use animation events to tie in very directly to UI state and game state. So any alteration to this state machine would break like the lockbox UI or render the game unplayable. So we could never clean this up. Try to avoid getting in the state in the first place. Additive spine blend. Looks like the simplest layer in the game. All it is is how we uh, keep your hands on screen as you look up, look down. Um, the subtlety here is this layer, its weight was actually driven by an animation parameter. Every frame we read the value of the spine blend weight and write it to this layer's weight. If you look in the animation editor, you can see there's like an add curve button. That allows you to go in and and hand animate any animation parameter you want in the game. So this let James go in, animate the strength of the spine blend inside of every animation in our game to fix any bugs he ran into where, you know, your hands are, you're looking up and then all of a sudden you start to vault over a log. We need your hands to come down and we need them to come down quickly, but we don't want it to pop. So by, ex by letting Mechanum animate itself, and feed into itself, you get a lot more power to your animators. Wouldn't be possible without the parameterized and kind of scripted nature of this. Uh, the next two states are just additive states for a little tiny fix up. They don't really do much. Uh, and this is all of the different animation systems working together. This is a full body animation that's keeping Henry looking down and getting his hands more or less into the area. This is our spine blend completely turned off because all of these lock boxes are the same height and then additive finger layers on top of that causing the movie to actually play, the movie to actually play. Um, So moving quickly into our specific case studies, here's going back to those cool guy moves, all the different mantles. Uh, you'll see they all have kind of two sub-state machines. This is a pattern that you should probably be using on any character that has a very player-driven, interactive feature. Uh, you've got a critical period and then a settle. If you think about like a shooting a revolver, you want the gun not to fire again until you're done once. But after that, and you're trying to come back to neutral, you want to be able to fire again. That would be critical section, settle. Every one of these moves has the same thing. You jump over a log, you land. We want to let you start walking again quickly, but we don't want to let you interrupt that jump. So you're breaking it up logically. You're saying, here's the part you can't interrupt. Here's the part you can. Digging in deeper to those, each one of those has variants inside of itself. So this is another example of hiding complexity. There's fast and slow versions of all of this. If you're, here you can see, maybe. So this is getting over a log slowly from a standing start. And same logical animation, different clips when you're moving fast. The reason you pull all of this into a substate inside of a substate inside of a substate is you've got a full body animation. You know that that's going to take over everything. You've then got, you know it's a cool guy move, so you pull into the cool guy moves. You know that there's a critical section. You look into the critical section, you've got the fast and the slow. Breaking all of that down like that means that you can track down a bug very, very quickly. If you have a problem with settle in general, if you have a problem with the critical section in general, you know that it's a transition in the parent state machine. If you have a problem only with slow, only with fast, you know it's a problem with the transition inside your substate machine. Using patterns like this, we found speeds of development massively. Our animator can go in, look at it, a 
perfectly set up cool guy move and make a variation on it, and he knows exactly how to do it. There's just, you have the one new int, the one new parameter that gets you into the substate machine. Everything else is exactly a duplicate. You know every transition you're gonna have to make, every clip you're gonna need to override. Makes it very easy to estimate how long variations take. And as I said, makes debugging and fixing this stuff a world's easier. Uh, another example of this is the hands. Our, we had like a bottle grip and then a big book grip. We had a, a small object grip. All of these are gonna have the exact same pattern here. This is the, uh, this is the book, this is large items. You can see that they're almost identical. Both of them have a pickup, I'm holding it, and then like five different ways to put it down. This is also another case where probably should have pulled some of this into a substate machine. So once you have your animations working correctly and your clips playing correctly, your characters looking like you want them to, you then need to feed back the state of your animators into the state of your game. Mechanum gives us a bunch of really good tools for doing that. Um, animation events let you tie a specific moment of a clip into a specific change of state of your game. Uh, these are perfect for like firing off effects, firing off sound effects, firing off particle effects, attaching and detaching other actors. They are, however, a little bit tricky to use reliably. If you transition out of a clip before the animation event is fired, it never will fire. And if the animation that is, is playing on a layer that has zero weight, no animation events will fire from that layer. Uh, in order to solve this on Firewatch, we actually added a state machine behavior that let us say, always fire this event. I don't care what happened. I don't care when we transitioned out. If we get to this point in time, fire it. If we leave this state, fire it anyway. This was perfect for things like dropping an object. Once the player has said, I wanna put down the baseball, I don't really care what else happens. At the end of that animation clip, it should be put down. Ideally, it gets thrown at the moment of release, but uh. Yeah, the speed of state machine behaviors, it's a bit of code similar to a mono behavior that you can attach to any mechanism state you want. Uh, these have excellent, like on start state, on exit state, on uh, state machine start, on stop, uh, on state machine exit, callbacks, very similar to like on start on enable. They're perfect for attaching behavior that you want to tie directly to your, the state of your animator itself. They are extremely bad, however, for writing gameplay code in inside of them. If you write too much gameplay code inside of a state machine behavior, it very quickly becomes difficult to track down where your changes in state are coming from. I highly recommend that if you're using state machine behaviors to drive gameplay code, use a messaging system. Talk to a manager, fire off uh, parameters at a higher level. Try not to write a ton of complicated code inside of them. You'll never remember what animator, what state, what layer, what, where did I put that code? Um, the exception is if you're writing state machine behaviors that drive your animator themselves. And debug.break. It is the single most useful state machine behavior. On state enter debug.break. You can attach it anywhere in your mechanism setup and you have a breakpoint, uh, just like you would in any other visual scripting system. Um, so. While Firewatch had Henry, which was one complicated character, ReCore had Luna, or Jewel, and the core bots. These had, were, Jewel has an enormous amount of player state, uh, and every one of the core bots has combat, special attacks, environmental attacks, navigation. So very, very complicated, very. Very complicated. <laughs> While this is definitely not gorgeous, it, it did work. This shipped a game. Uh, the shipped a game in extremely high quality with extremely complex characters. On some level, when you're dealing with complex content, you're going to end up with complex data. 
If you look at the state machine, though, you'll notice that there's a, most states only have transitions out, not transitions in. The reason for that is not only did uh, every one of the core bots have a complicated animation state machine, they also had a complicated AI state machine that they needed to keep perfectly in sync all the time. If you find yourself in a similar situation, that's when you should just skip Mechanum. It's a visual scripting language built to do animation, but if you've got another scripting language, if you have another state machine that's driving your behavior, Mechanum can still just be used to drive just the animation itself. Use animator.play, crossfade, crossfade over fixed time. You can make dynamic transitions without having to worry about the complicated tree structure that you know, can otherwise get really, really difficult to look at. Once you're dealing with a tree at the complexity of Joule, you can't really afford to set up that kind of state machine more than once. Um, you have to remove as much work as you possibly can. You're, you know, once you've gotten to the point where your tree is sprawling, you don't want to have to grow another one. A couple of different ways that Mechanum lets you do that. Um, for Joule, uh, Armature used synced layers. So a synced layer, for those that may not know, is you set up a tree once, you set up all of your state once. In the case of Joule, it was every single piece of locomotion animation. Every movement, every jump, all of it. All, every possible player state when moving around the world. And then they made two sync layers for aiming and hip firing. You immediately get every state replicated, you get every transition replicated you are guaranteed that all three of those layers will always be identical except for the clips inside of them. So you can then go in and say, replace all of these clips with the exact same animation but holding the gun out, aiming the gun up. If you're doing the same kind of thing for multiple controllers, multiple characters, um, we have a, there's a better tool in Mechanum, which is the runtime override controller. Works kind of similarly. It lets you take a dictionary of animations and replace them with a dictionary of other clips. Um, an example of that would be the core bots. These guys are both playing their idle. They look entirely different. Exact same state machine set up. Only difference is when you spawn in the spider, there's a runtime animation controller that's a runtime override controller that says, replace the dog idle with the spider idle. Uh, this is best used for uh, spawning in AI variants or variant players. Uh, currently, there is a bit of a hitch when you first set the runtime override controller. You'll lose any state that you have. So if your characters are on screen while you're doing it, uh, it causes a little bit of issues. This, I believe, is getting fixed. But for the time being, use this on spawn. So between Firewatch and ReCore and a bunch of my friends Unity projects, I've seen a lot of the same sort of problems crop up over and over and over and over again in animation setups. Um, if you find yourself with a chunk of your tree that has just become unmanageably complicated, you're having constant transitions, constant interruptions, it's very easy to lose what state you're supposed to be in, that chunk of your tree should probably be a blend tree. Uh, you also want to make very, very, keep a close eye on the interrupt settings of all of your transitions. It's very easy to find yourself in a situation where you're transitioning from, say, walking to falling. You begin that transition, you land because you were just off of a little step. Transition back to from uh, falling to walking, but you still play an entire cycle of that fall loop. Um, if you set your initial transition to interrupt based on the next state, it'll shortcut all of that. If you start finding problems where you're just not responsive enough, it's probably the interrupt settings on a given transition. Um, if you find yourself completely in the wrong state, it could be that you've got animation events that are getting skipped. Use the reliable animation events that I was talking about earlier. Um, and this is going to be a rough one to say. I feel bad for anybody that uses this heavily. But the other problem is you might be using triggers. I know triggers are widely used in Mechanum. They're super simple. They're really easy to set up. They cause a ton of issues. If you use a trigger and any transition anywhere in your Mechanum setup uh, listens for that trigger, it's going to clear it. 
that means that you can have a perfectly working animation controller. Anybody on the team can go in on any layer for any reason and set up any transition that uses that trigger and break previously perfectly functional code. Uh, and it's really, really difficult to track that down. Uh, this happened up on, us on Firewatch more than once. Uh, we eventually just sort of moved away from triggers where possible. Additionally, triggers once set and, uh, do not get unset until you manually do it or uh, the trigger actually gets used in a transition. Um, this very often will cause issues where you, know, you hit the button to throw an object while you are vaulting over something you can't. By the time Henry was done finishing his long animation, he jumps over the thing, stands back up, like, okay, perfect. <laughs> what? Why? Uh, oh, right, I clicked the button 15 seconds ago and I don't even remember what happened. Um, you can fix that by clearing out uh, triggers manually, but it's a lot easier just to avoid using them in most cases. So if you're making like a simple mechanism for a UI element or a door that's going to open and close, by all means use triggers. But if you're shooting for something that's going to have multiple layers, multiple substates, lots of transitions, try to avoid them where possible. As a tree gets this big, it's going to start getting slow. You're going to start running into performance problems, potentially. Um, one of the first things I would look at if you're having uh, the animator show up in the profiler is if you see the temp alloc overflow message anywhere in the profiler, that means you just have too many clips. Uh, what that's saying is that we've run out of our extremely fast memory allocator space and are now go falling back to the sort of default under the hood generic Unity allocator. Uh, the other common problem is too much blending. Uh, Mechanum is very smart. If you have a layer at zero weight or a blend at zero weight, nothing will get processed whatsoever. However, zero and very, very, very close to zero are not the same number. Um, the easiest way to fix this is to just go in and make sure that your parameters clamp to actually zero if they get low. Uh, whenever you're setting your parameter, if you're setting it to like lower than 0 0.01, 0 0.001, just clamp it to zero. Uh, this can actually cause a lot of speed up if you have a lot of different blend states that are all minutely in there because you've got like a tiny, tiny bit of like left or right on the stick all the time because of a dead zone. Um, yeah, so as you build your visual script, visual state machines, as you build in Mechanum, just try to keep in mind that you are working with a visual script system. Think about it like code. Code takes maintenance. Every time you go have a big public facing demo, schedule a day to go back in and clean it up, just like you would all of the hacks that you put in to ship it. Um, try and simplify where possible. Try to build with reuse as you go forward. And if you keep your you know, tree from growing uncontrollably, you'll end up with a very you know, polishable character. You can end up with a very high quality bar like Armature did with Luna or we did with Henry. Um, thank you very much.